All right, good morning. So um, I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about the Kepler mission and some of the data challenges that we have with respect to processing the data to find small planets. I'd like to thank Michael for putting this all together. It's been great working on the book. Um, in my spare time on the weekends when the kids aren't sick or anything. Anyway, this is a, a real pleasure for me to be here because it's, um, I usually go to astronomy conferences and it's really great to see people really into data analysis and that's um, where I find most of my pleasure. Okay, so I did work for the SETI Institute. The Kepler mission is a discovery class mission that was selected back in 2001. Um, uh, over 3,000 people at Ball Aerospace actually worked on the mission from the proposal through the uh, design, development, and uh, then delivery of the flight segment of the spacecraft and instrument. And there are several dozen people on the science team and the uh, associate collaborators and lots of institutions. So I do work at the SETI Institute, but we have uh, SAO, um, LAS, Haynes Research Center, which is where we manage the mission right now. Uh, JTL managed to build up, and so and uh, the Space Telescope is where our archive is. So I encourage everyone to go and download data since we've got the first 120 days out there already. Okay, so uh, today's talk, I'll give you an overview of the Kepler mission and the science pipeline that processes the data. I'll talk specifically about transiting planet search uh, with, about the algorithm we've chosen that allows us to find uh, transit signatures in the data. And I'll talk to you about one of the challenges that we're grappling with now and an approach that we're, um, that we're developing to handle uh, this particular situation where, where the functionality isn't quite what we, or performance isn't quite what we want. And then I'll follow up with some conclusions. So, at any rate, uh, Kepler is a uh, 1.4 meter telescope. It's got a 1.4 meter primary mirror in the back end here. It's got a 0.9 uh, five meter aperture. And it's in an Earth trailing Spitzer-like orbit. So, um, so it's in its own orbit around the sun. That is very important because that, that puts us in a very benign environment where we don't have perturbations like low Earth orbiting satellites have with going in and out of the shadow of the Earth. And so we don't have large thermal excursions um, and we don't see light scattered off the Earth or from the moon, which low Earth orbiting satellites do as well. So this orbit was specifically chosen so that we could uh, achieve our, our required photometric precision of 20 parts per million in six and a half hours. So to give you an idea of what that means, uh, from the ground typically people get 0.1% um, uh, or, or a millinag. And on four meter class telescopes, if we work really hard, you can drive that down maybe by an order of magnitude or so. But the signals that we're looking for here are 100 parts per million. Earth transiting the sun is 84 parts per million for a central transit. So we're talking about really small signatures. Um, and you also are fighting the day-night cycle. If you're trying to do this from the ground, uh, the stars only up, right? At most 12 hours night, and most of those hours, or many of those hours aren't photometric, you've got weather. So we really had to go to space to do this. So here's our field of view. We also have to look at a lot of stars because we're looking for transits, occasions when the planet crosses in front of the star from our viewpoint. And the chance of that alignment is the size of the star divided by the size of the orbit. So we're talking about a sun-like star with a diameter of 1% uh, of an AU, and you, you're looking for planets that are at one AU orbits, that means that you have about a half percent chance of seeing that, um, that planet transit that star, because you don't know how the orbits are oriented, right? What's an AU, John? I'm sorry? Tell them what an AU is. Oh, okay. So an astronomical unit, an AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, right? So we're in a one AU orbit about the Sun. So that's why we have 105 to uh, square degrees in our field of view that are unvignetted. We actually have a, almost 116 square degrees on silicon. Um, and that also drove the design of the telescope. We needed a telescope that could have a large field of view. So to give you an idea, our field of view is about the size of your palm held at arm's length, whereas the field of view for the Hubble Space Telescope is about a grain of sand held at arm's length. So it's a very different problem. We're not trying to make pretty pictures. Our object is to measure the brightnesses of all these stars over time. Because we need a lot of stars, we have a large field of view, and indeed we have 150,000 targets on our planetary target list. And we observe at any given time up to 165,000 stars. Those other 15,000 are for guest observers and science team targets that allow us to do control studies and to study other populations of stars that are of interest to us. So, um, anyway, we also chose the field of view to be very dense star wise because we wanted to have lots of sun-like stars in the field of view. So that means you need to look near the galactic plane 
And if you're interested in doing follow-up for NASA, most of its assets available for follow-up are in the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, it turns out that Cygnus is basically the best bet for this mission uh, for all those reasons. So that's, that's what drove us to choose this field of view. Okay, so it's a baseline for a three and a half year mission. We have uh, hy enough hydrazine that we could go out as long as about 10 years or so. And I'm hoping that we last that long. As long as things are working well, I think they'll keep us going. Okay, it's broadband, white light. Um, uh, some recent Kepler news. Uh, in January, we announced the first confirmed rocky planet, Kepler 10b. This is the first planet that's unambiguously made of rock. It's 1.4 uh, Earth radii. It's in a 0.8 day period orbit about its star. Uh, this was very exciting indeed. Uh, there are other planets that may be rocky. Corot uh, 7 is, is the first example of something that's likely to be rocky, but the error bars, the error ellipses on its <coughs> density, um, on the mass and size are, are, are really broad, and so it's, it's less and less likely now after several years that it's actually rocky. Um, uh, but, you know, some people still have their bets on. Anyway, um, back at the beginning of this month, we announced uh, that we've identified over 1,200 new planetary candidates in our data. And uh, most are closer to Earth in size rather than close to the uh, giant planets that have been previously discovered. So most are smaller than Neptune's. Maybe 68 are less than 1.25 Earth radii. So, and 54 are in or near the habitable zone of their star. So we, for the first time in history, we have a sample of, uh, of Earth-sized planets, and we have a sample of, of planets in the habitable zones of other stars. So this is uh, proving just, I think, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the watershed that Kepler is going to provide to the extrasolar planet community. Uh, question here. Um, yes. Just to get the perspective of mine, in, before mm -hmm. January, there were known, I think, five, only 500. Right about, that's the, right, that's right. So that's a massive, that's been a huge increase. This potentially triples the number of known uh, planets. Now, these are candidates still, because although we, oh. we have no indication that they're not planets, and we have strong reason to believe they are planets, we haven't been able to follow up and confirm them. In fact, we're letting the community help out. On the other hand, our estimates are that, our internal estimates are that on the order, no more than about 20% of our candidates are false positives. There's an independent paper out there by uh, John Johnson, who estimates our false positive rate is closer to 10%. And there's a question in the back. Uh, your, your sample is, is uh, biased by the bandwidth you look at? Um, not really. We, we sample stars that are, half, you know, uh, M dwarfs that are about half the size, half the size and mass of the sun, so the coolest main sequence stars that are burning hydrogen, um, out to early A stars, which are uh, twice as big as the sun. And the reason we restrict ourselves to that range, which is very broad, it covers almost the full spectrum of main sequence stars, is that our primary mission was originally four years, and by the time, if you look at larger stars than the early A's, the habitable zone is too far out for us to collect enough transits in our primary mission. So um, we, are, we are volume limited, or it's a magnitude limited survey. So we, we go from about ninth magnitude to about 16th magnitude. And uh, we've got lots of Gs, lots of Fs, lots of Ks, 3,000 M stars, the brightest of which is 10th magnitude. So, um, and, and then um, at the same day that we announced uh, these candidates, we also have released all the data for the first 120 days on approximately 180,000 stars. Um, we announced the, uh, the confirmation of six transiting planets around one star, Kepler 11. So this is a very compact, very quick layer. So, yes? Is there an official RV follow-up program for the candidates that makes sense to do RV follow-up? Oh, yes. We, do. we have a very active follow-up observing program. Uh, uh, people like Jeff Marcy, Bill Cochran, Dave Latham, and other people helping out. We use a suite of um, assets, including CAC, to do RV follow-up. But we also do high, res high spatial resolution imaging to help us out as well, and um, some other measurements. So. Like you mentioned with RV follow-up. Ah, greater velocity. So, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but please remind me if I don't. Okay, so let me go on. Okay, so this is the folded light curve for Kepler 10. And uh, it's 1.4 Earth radii, it's in a 0.83 day period orbit, and this is the model fitted to the data. And uh, the transit depth is 0.00015, so this is 150 parts per million. So this is pretty darn good. Um, nobody's seen photometry this good um, ever. So Kepler is really performing phenomenally. 
Um, certainly uh, much better than my worst expectations, my worst fears in working with this program for over 16 years. Um, watching them design and then build the instrument test it. So, so we are doing extremely well. Um, now just to give you an idea, uh, before Kepler, we had discovered about 70 um, transiting planets. Now, first one was discovered in 2000, HD 20945 AD. That was the first planet discovered that happened to be transiting. Um, the first planet that was discovered around a main sequence star was 51 Peg in 1995. It took about five years before we actually found one that was transiting its star. Up to that point in time, people were, some people were saying, well, maybe these aren't stars, maybe these are just substellar companions that are formed in the same way that binary stars were formed. They really aren't planets. Uh, but once we started detecting transiting planets, all those arguments fell away because we clearly saw once you got transits, you get the size of the planet, you've got the mass from radial velocity where you're measuring the reflex motion. The radial velocity is the velocity of a star along the line of sight by looking at the spectrum and watching it get red and blue shifted. So if you put those two things together, you get the density. So most of these planets detected um, before are closer in size to Jupiter or larger. So Jupiter's about 11 times the radius of the Earth. So these are Jupiter in larger size. Um, here's Neptune, and here's Corvo 7b. Um, and indeed, most of the 500 planets are much closer in size to Jupiter than they are to um, Earth. Oh, they're, in the last several years, people are pushing down with radial velocity to detect super Earth things that are up to something like four times the size of Earth, between Neptune and, and Earth size. So we've seen a rapid revolution in this brand new field. Because of course, you know, when I was in grad school, nobody was doing this, and the few people that were were, were tracking their claims. So, uh, exoplanet science communities have to be very conservative in in broaching the subject, coming to the fore with these discoveries. But we're seeing lots of productivity uh, with radial velocity um, campaigns, and now with transit surveys coming online, uh, it's it's getting even better. So. Uh, last year, we released the first 44 days of data, and we released the identities of uh, about 700 candidates. Well, these are 305 that we released to the, the world. And you see, we're pushing down with Kepler down towards Earth size. We're also pushing out in terms of the orbital period because both radial velocity and transit surveys are more sensitive to planets that are closer in to their parent star and to larger or more massive bodies. So. <coughs> We, we only had 44 days of data, so we only had, we could estimate, because we had more data than we were releasing, the periods of, of these objects out to about 100 days. Um, and then, beginning of this month, boom, these are the rest of the candidates that fill in the 1,235. So we're pushing down to planets that are smaller than Earth size and pushing our periods out as we accumulate more data. So this is extremely exciting uh, to be a part of all this and to, to see this happening. I, and a lot of, you know, I think if I were on the sidelines, I'd be cheering too, because it's just great, it's phenomenal. Um, so this is the changing picture of, of um, extra solar planet science uh, in near real time. Okay, and so the other thing to do is, since we know the, the mass of these stars, or have estimates from the mass of these stars, and the effective temperatures, and the sizes, and the distances to, um, that we can estimate the distance we can have, to the planet in its orbit, and then we can also estimate the equilibrium temperature of the planet. So this is a plot of the equilibrium temperature versus the, uh, the, the size. So things we're really interested in are down here in the habitable zone, but because we're only looking at short periods so far, the habitable zones um, for most of our stars are further out. So if something's in the habitable zone, which the 54 candidates we talked about are, those are largely uh, habitable zones of smaller, cooler stars that have much shorter orbital periods in their half zones. <coughs> yes? Can you say something about that one that's all the way down by zero relative to Earth's size? Um, well, this is, not a, this is not zero down here. So this is four, three, two, one, and this is a, so uh, this is a scale. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I'd have to look that. It's, it's on our list, but I think the smallest candidate we have is about 0.7. So this is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. There may okay. be a 0 0.5 there, something about half, half the size. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over and talk about uh, how we process this data to actually make these detections in the first place. So this is the science pipeline. This is how we turn pixels into planets. So here's an image of a star. In fact, this was a star that has a known transiting planet that was discovered the year before we launched in 2008. And we launched in March of 2009. This is half P7b. It's very bright. It's about 10th magnitude. It's actually saturated and bleeding slightly because CCDs have a finite well depth. So if you collect too much charge, they start spilling like ice cube trays. Okay, um, 
At any rate, the first thing we do is we have to calibrate pixels. There are a number of on-ship artifacts that we have to deal with, and, and you want to put the data back on a linear scale where you, where you know, want to know how many photoelectrons you collected in each frame and each pixel. And so you have to correct for things like nonlinearity. You have to correct for the fact that we don't have a shutter. You have to correct for the fact that there's, um, that there's a, a black level or bias voltage that is a function of where you are on the CCDs. All that kind of stuff. So the first step in the pipeline is to process the, the uh, pixels to calibrate those. Once you've calibrated the pixels, then you can actually do your photometric analysis um, where you essentially sum up the pixels underneath the image of each star to estimate the brightness. At the same time, you also measure the location of the star. You measure a centroid. This proves to be very important in terms of false positive rejection. And it's also the reason why, one in part, one reason why Corot has not proved to be quite as productive as we all hoped that Corot would have been. Corot is a 40 centimeter uh, transit uh, survey. Well, it's a telescope with 40 centimeters in low Earth orbit, set up to do astro seismology and uh, detect exoplanets. And they were launched in 2007, and to date they've detected 15 uh, planets, well, two of which are brown dwarfs, so 13 planets, um, which is a great disappointment. But in part, it's because they, they do their photometry on board. They don't measure the locations of their stars. Why this is important is because um, we've got large pixels. When you're, do, when you're doing transit surveys, you want a lot of sky. So our pixels are, are four arc seconds on a side. That you can have a lot of stars in four arc seconds. And so if your target star has a dim background eclipsing binary nearby, that background eclipsing binary is diluted by the, by the foreground target star. And so rather than seeing a 50% drop in brightness for, a, for an eclipsing binary of two equal components, you might see a 0.1% drop in brightness or a 0.01% drop in brightness. So uh, what we can do is in the pipeline is detect capillary and clots, things that look like regularly spaced uh, negative pulses. And eclipses look the same as transits once the star is degraded to a certain extent. So, so uh, we expect a, a large number of false uh, triggers on background eclipsing binaries. But if you measure the, the position of the stars, then what you'll see for background eclipsing binaries, is in almost all the cases, it's going to be slightly offset on the sky from your target star. It's like having two weights on a balance. And if you take the star damage, you're taking a little weight off here, and so it tips this way. So you'll see a shift in the location, the measured location of the star on the sky that's correlated with the transit. So you'll see a shift in transit from the baseline out of transit location of the star proves to be a very powerful technique for identifying blends where you might have a background eclipsing binary. Now, on the converse, it could be that you have a stable background star and, and the planet is really transiting the target star. And you'll see a, the same effect. You'll see a correlation between the photocenter motion and, and the photometry. Uh, what this is is a note, a yellow flag that, gosh, we've got to do a little follow-up. So one of the most important things we do for follow-up for such cases is we get high-resolution, uh, either speckled or adaptive optics imaging on these targets so we understand what the distribution and brightnesses are of stars that are near our target star that are well within uh, you know w well within the scale of a couple of pixels of our star it's below the resolution of our targets where do you get that data from uh let's see we get uh speckle at the win and then andrea dupre is doing higher is doing the adaptive optics and i forget exactly where we're doing that but um, it's from the ground it's from the ground yeah we also uh have some follow-up with Spitzer and some proposed follow-up with HST. Um, anyway, so one, once you understand what the stars are that are near your star that we don't know about beforehand because they're not in our original catalog or therefore or you can't distinguish those stars in our images because they're too coarse, then you can actually interpret the centroid shifts and tell whether it's which star it is. So the centroid will always move away from the source. So it provides you with a magnitude and a direction. Um, from the baseline position, and so we're able to sort these things out. So most, so sometimes it's the, it turns out to be a planet. Sometimes it turns out to be a background eclipsing binary. Um, now the next step in our process is to actually is, is the hardest one I think uh, because it's the hardest to get working as well as we'd like, and that's what we call pre-surface data conditioning, where we identify and remove systematic errors. So uh, it turns out uh, Kepler is, is much like any other instrument that's a couple of orders magnitude better than anything in its class before, and that is that once you invented the world's best photometer, but also invented the world's best thermometer. So it's very sensitive uh, as a photometer, but it's also very sensitive to its thermal environment. And although we're in a very benign Earth trailing orbit, um, there are still thermal changes on, on board that are important when you're looking at the, at the photometric time series. So I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. 
Um, and then we've got corrected light curves we send through transient planet search, and that's where we look for the periodic pulse trains. Once we identify what we call threshold crossing events, because they're not planets yet, uh, things that look like they have statistically significant signatures that are correlated or look like transiting planets, then we subject those to a suite of diagnostic tests. One of those tests is to look at the centroid shift that we measured up in parametric analysis. We also look for things like we, we analyze the depth of the alternating transits to see if there's a significant difference between even and odd that would be indicative of an eclipsing binary with slightly different size components. Um, we look for um, uh, small changes in the, in the intervals between the even and odd transits because you can have a slight elliptical orbit of two equal components in an eclipsing binary. And we also uh, remove or mask off the first transit signature we see and look for additional planets. That's very important because it turns out that about 20% of our stars that appear to host planets host multiple transient planets. So we need to be able to detect multiple transient planets. Maybe the largest such system we have is Kepler 11, where we have six identified transient planets in one system. Yes? They've been I'm through sure this. I remember we're trying to confirm and validate. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we talk about two things. Data validation is our pipeline that furnishes a suite of diagnostics to the science team. We use that to rank and prioritize the candidates for the follow up observing. And part of that is, you know, what kind of stars. Because some stars you can't do good radio velocity measurements, like early stars, A stars. Uh, and they're too hot. They don't have enough features in their spectra. Um, and and so all, all the candidates go through this process, then it then becomes more of a person process where we have um, people that actually uh, fit models that are uh, have more sophistication than the ones we're fitting in data validation where we extract the, um, the, the physical parameters of the system. Um, so all the candidates have been through the system and none of them have failed outright any of the tests that we perform internally either in the pipeline or, or the other tests that people do in the science team afterwards. But, those candidates are at various levels of uh, maturity with respect to they have RV taken um, or even a reconnaissance um, spectroscopy to see whether you see double lines that would be indicative of an eclipsing binary from the start or something else funny going on. So you really have to look at the tables in Bill Baruchy's paper um, that's on Astro PH actually to learn the details about each candidate and how confident we are that it's a planet. So we have several levels. Yes? So it's too early to talk about Planet Zoo or is that? Oh, there's a planet too. It's called uh, Planet Hunters. So, in terms of people actually looking through these light curves to identify planets on their own, yes. Is this pipeline um, or is Kepler sensitive enough to detect large moons around? Yes, it is. Um, our pipeline is not set up to detect those automatically because they're not evenly spaced throughout its signals. So, but we do have science team members who are very in a working group that are working on that. Okay, so. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of what the data look like, this is a highly stretched clipped image, so I can uh, show you the artifacts we have to deal with. So the vertical lines here do affect, we operate without a shutter. We integrate for six seconds, and then we read out, it takes half a second to read the whole CCD out. So a pixel that's here for six seconds and travels down and hits that star on its way out, so it picks up light from all the sources below it. At the same time, a new pixel is being read into place to sit there for the next six seconds, and it sees all the targets above its locations for the integration. So the first order, the smear trails are uniform and constant along each column, but they vary over time and vary from column to column. So we have two special regions we use to measure that and subtract it off as part of the pixel level calibration. So the other feature that you can see are these horizontal features. Those are caused by uh, the clock signals driving the fine guidance sensors that are in the corners of our focal plane. And they're causing small DC offsets uh, when each of these pixels is being digitized through the analog to digital converter. And uh, it's a synchronous system, so this represents fixed pattern noise that we measured before launch. <coughs> we confirmed that it was still the same on orbit and we model and remove as part of our calibrations. So, um, and then we're focusing in on one star, this is half key 7 e and you see we essentially only send down about 5% of the data because we can't afford to store it on board. Yes? This is a trade-off because the telescope doesn't move. You said something earlier that the telescope doesn't move. So if it doesn't move, uh -huh. you can't, you have to, you, you can't track it so the, the stars move on the focal plane. Oh, no, the stars don't move on the focal plane. So the fine guided sensors uh, track and, and take out the aberration to first order. So, so, the, so then why is this streaking? Oh, because you're reading out the CCD and there's no shutter. 
Set it on. So you're, you're moving the charge down the column, oh, I see. Okay. but light is contained on right. the sensor. No shutter to increase your integration time. No, no shutter because we couldn't afford to build one uh, at a high enough reliability that it would you could guarantee it won't fail open or close. Right. It's, it would be a single point failure. Right. right. So, yeah. and micro shutters haven't been invented yet. So, uh, James Webb Space Telescope will have micro shutters. Uh, that technology didn't exist when we were building the camera. Okay. So, um, so we only store about five percent of the data. Six million. Yes. But now, jitter is important because yes. you're summing pixels. I'll, I'll talk about that a little okay. bit. But yes, um, there are a number of um, uh, systematics, and that's one of the principal systematics. It was what we thought would be the dominant systematic. Our pointing precision is to, is required to be. Um, point, um, point oh 0.09 arc seconds, three sigma in 15 minutes and longer. And our pixels are four arc seconds. So, so to three sigma, we're talking about a hundred. We're talking about a hundredth of a pixel. I'm sorry, one sigma is about a hundredth of a pixel or so. So our, our pointing precision is actually really good. It's comparable to Hubble's. Um, and it turns out that the, the pointing jitter is not such an issue for for uh, the precision that's important to us. It turns out to be other things. So uh, I'll talk about that in a little while. So here's transient point search. So to motivate this, you have to understand what beast you're dealing with when you're designing a detection algorithm. And this is, uh, these are measurements of the sun over about a four year time span from SOHO. We see that we start out in 1996 at near solar minimum. You see the rotation of the sun because there are some features on the sun that you can see modulating the, uh, the output, the irradiance. Over time, the uh, sun rotates average uh, period of 27 days. So you can see that in the data. And then you see spots starting to erupt as you approach solar max. Two things you can notice from this is, um, well, at least one, and that is it's, it's not stationary. And the other thing you notice, it doesn't look like white noise. So you need a, you need a detector that is adaptive. It can adapt to the changing conditions of the observation noise you're dealing with. Um, and that can deal with colored noise or non-white noise. So those were the, uh, so um, luckily back in the 60s, People that had worked all this out. So at least if you talk, if you're talking about filtered Gaussian processes, there are optimal detectors. The optimal te detector is basically it exits your data, your time series. What you do is you project that onto your signal of interest, um, but you have to account for the correlation structure of your noise, and that's what this correlation matrix R is. So, so if the data are white, then R inverse just evolves down into one over sigma, and you're just taking the dot product of the data with the signal and you're and you're normalizing it by the noise of your signal. So you're just looking to see how parallel your 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 data vector is with your signal vector. And if they're co-aligned, then you say, hey, I've, and there's and it's got a large size, magnitude, then you say, hey, I've got a strong signal. That's basically all this is. So there's a normalization factor here that turns out to be the estimated signal to noise ratio of your reference signal. Um, so that, that puts this test statistic on, on a sig in terms of sigma. So you're talking about a seven sigma detection, a three sigma detection, whatever. Now if that's higher than your threshold, then you say you have a detection. Um, if the noise is stationary, you can actually transpose this into the, into the frequency domain, and this provides a little more uh, intuition, at least for those <coughs> people like myself who like 4A stuff. And in this case, uh, the real need of this is that what you're doing is you're multiplying the, the Fourier transform of your data with the Fourier transform of your signal, and you're normalizing it by the power spectral density of the noise. So this is what this looks like. These curves here on the right are power spectral density estimates for the sun based on that data I showed you earlier. And you see there's a lot more power out here at long time scales, <coughs> short time scales. And uh, these are, are uh, basically power spectral density estimates of uh, uh, an eight hour transit and a 12 hour transit. So the reason why this works for Kepler is that for sun like stars, transits are short and spots rotate in and out of view on time scales of weeks and longer. So we have a time scale or frequency separation between the two signals. It's kind of like listening to um, barbershop quartet for the tenor to be singing his solo. If the bass and the baritone stopped in the bar on their way and they're singing out of tune and they're singing loud, too loud, you can still hear the, the tenor because your ear can separate the frequency space. But what about for M dwarfs? And the works are a bit higher for those rotation rates. Um, well, in general, they're they're older, so they're smaller and they spun down even more. But they are more active. So not all, you know. So each star is its own thing. We have to estimate or characterize the noise for each star independently, and that's what we do. So wavelets are natural choice because wavelets are a time joint time frequency representation. And we've chosen a filter band implementation. This is a lot like a graphic equalizer you might have with your stereo system, 
where the, the lights tell you exactly how loud the, or how much energy or power there is in, in each of those channels at any particular point in time. And, and what we do is essentially we convolve the data with uh, a, a bank of filters, and each filter picks off a different region in the Fourier domain, and it's orthogonal, which is really nice. Okay, so um, what that allows you to do then is, is to um, look in each of these channels to estimate the noise power in that channel, and then you can whiten the data, which is essentially what you want to do if we go back here is that that whitener or the power spectral density to do your detection what you do is you divide your, your data for a transform multiplied by the transform of your signal by the inverse power spectral density of the noise process. So it means stuff out here isn't going to get much weight. Stuff down here gets a lot of weight. So this is where we're able to detect stuff is in this region. So that's really what it says. So, um, this is a, a signal flow diagram that shows the bank of filters, and then the data comes in here, and each channel has its own time series coming out. We estimate the noise power. That's just give an analysis window that's just RMSing with stuff going through it. And then you can bot it with a corresponding channel signal from the reference transit pulse. And you're correlating that um, in each channel. And then you use Parsifal's relation in this frame, this wave of frame, to build up your statistic. So it means that in MATLAB, that's only about 20 lines of code. It's very efficient. OK, so here's uh, Kepler-like noise plus transits. And this is SOHO data with noise per <coughs> Kepler. Um, and there are four size transits in here. Can anybody see them? Sure. Sure? Yeah. On this scale, uh, an earth size transit is 0.1 watts per square meter. So it's a fifth of this major tip. So I guess we all see them, but uh, I don't know many of us could actually point them out by coming up here and pointing on the screen. But if you apply this wavelet, adaptive match filter, these are the single event statistics as a function of time. The blue data is with transits, the red is without. So we see blue spikes where the transits are located. And then the idea is to fold the data. If you choose the right period um, and you fold the data and stack it on top of itself, the transits are aligned. They act coherently, but the noise doesn't. So it allows you to build up your, your signal noise ratio. So in this case, uh, we get a, a total signal noise ratio of about 11. So this is a clear detection. Our threshold should be about seven sigma to reject <coughs> statistical false alarms. Okay. Uh, and then you can, and this is a projection. This is the maximum statistic you get for each trial period. But if you look at this trial period um, as a function of time to first transit, there it is. Okay, so this is a simulation, but it's using real SOHO data. Now this is real data. This is a much deeper transit than Earth. You can actually see it easily by eye. But here's what the correlation time series looks like. And you see the data in between the transits looks quite white. And uh, this is the normalization time series. So this is the other part that goes with this. We uh, estimate our combined differential photometric precision. Uh, this is in ppm. So this is 100 parts per million for this star. And then down here are the single event statistics in sigma. So each of these events is about a 30 sigma event. Uh, so this is an illustration of how this works with the signal you can, you can actually see by eye. What creates the negative dip? Uh, the negative dip here? Yeah. That's because you're correlating the pulse. The, the, it's like going into a fun house where the lightning filter makes the data look white, but it's distorted your transit. So it's like going into a fun house looking for a friend's face, but you know the shape of the mirror, so you know you can predict how your friend's face will be distorted. But you're moving, you don't know where these things are, so as you move this transit mask across your whitened data, um, uh, it, you, you get your peak when they're centered on top of one another, but then you get these, this ringing because your white filter is a high pass filter and it takes a transit and accentuates the edges. Okay, and then you fold it and here's the period. And then here's the phase and here it is at 13 days into the data. Okay, I'm going to turn my attention now to pre search data conditioning. Plus, uh, sorry, yes. Plus, you can also make predictions and tell when, when you should be seeing it in the future and go back and see if you're right. That's another way of confirming, no? Well, it is. It's something that we that we do outside of the pipeline. So the pipeline furnishes us with candidates, and we keep track of those to see what's happening. But yes, um, we do do that. Um, so pre-search data conditioning often does a good job. So these are two stars. The red is the original light curve or, or flat site series, and the blue is what comes down from DC. We've got a number of operational activities that can impact the photometry. Uh, pointing tweaks where we had larger than expected drift in the pointing at the beginning of the mission before the flight segment actually tuned up their algorithm. <coughs> um, so that we injected offsets intentionally uh, to keep things aligned because we only send down the poster stamps. So if we wander outside the poster stamps, bad news, you don't get your data, you don't get your planets. 
And we had some safe modes, and during these early safe modes, we turned off the photometer so it cooled down. The principal heat load is the, are, the, are the CCDs and the associated electronics, so turn the thing back on and it heats up. Well, um, even though we had, quote, equilibrium, um, you can still see the thermal signature four or five days into the data. So our algorithm has to deal with these operationally uh, induced uh, thermal signatures or other signatures in the data. And also we have radiation events that cause uh, near instantaneous drops in the quantum efficiency of individual pixels by about 1%, it seems to be quantized. And uh, that causes drops in step discontinuities in the, in the time series that you can see here and here. So PDC has to deal with these things and try to correct them. In at least two cases, it's doing a pretty good job. But I'll show you an example where it's not. So the blue light curve, this is an eclipsing binary. It's got spot-induced variations on it. Very interesting astrophysically. Um, but what we do with PDC is we're handing it a bunch of measurements of systematics or things that are associated with systematics, like pointing jitter, like the measurements of the pointing of the over time, and the focus change over time, and uh, the temperature over time of the uh, detectors, that kind of thing. And it finds a linear combination of those things that reduces the bulk R mass of the blue when you subtract it off, but it does a lot of bad things to this light curve. As you can see, the blue light curve does not have all this hair and fuzz on it. Now, this hair and fuzz is real stuff going on in the photometer, but a, a straight least square fit really can't, doesn't know the difference. So um, that's what is motivating us to find another way. So uh, the problem with least squares approaches is they attempt to uh, explain everything about the light curve that you give it, about the thing you're trying to model, about the data. And it doesn't, you know, there's, it, it, it doesn't just try to explain things that it can explain well. It doesn't know the difference. Um, and there's no simple way that least squares fits and put on the brakes. It can't understand that a, a change in pointing of one million pixel can only induce at most a 0.1% change in a light curve. It doesn't know that. So it's happy to say this 0.1 millipixel change in position can explain 10% change in flux. So, um, so it's all like taking a, a puzzle out of a box where you see the picture on the box. You know, but not, and there are only 20% of the pieces there. We square is happy to work with 20% of the pieces and put it together so it approximates the picture on the box. But it's, it's really doing the things that you don't want it to do to your data. But this is what least squared is really good at. It tries to explain everything it can about the data, and oftentimes it can distort uh, the fit so that it gives you a good approximation, but it's also introducing a lot of noise or artifacts. So the problem is to find model that best fits data. So I don't want to bore you with a lot of math, but here's our estimate of what the data should be. This, this is our model y hat. We've got a, a linear model, so H is a design matrix. Each, each column is a, is a vector like temperature change over time, pointing change over time, whatever. And, it, and theta are our coefficients. So we want to take a linear combination of the vectors in H to try to explain the data Y. Um, what we'd like to do is bring in side information because the power of Kepler is that we have 170, up to 170,000 targets. And on each detector, we have approximately 2,000 targets. So we can look at the behavior of the stars as an ensemble to try to <coughs> Uh, constrain what the coefficients are for the fit. And I think a really good way of doing that is to, is to use the maximum a posteriori approach. And what that is, is what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize the uh, probability uh, for a given set of coefficient values given the data that you're handed. Now that's hard to deal with, but you can rewrite this using Bayes' rules so that what you're doing is you're maximizing the likelihood of the data given the coefficients scale by the probability that those coefficient values exist, right? So uh, this term PFC, that's the prior probability of the coefficients. And that's something we can derive from the ensemble of light curves. And this first term, if you if you ignore the fact that it's, uh, if you take it out of its Bayesian context, this leads to least squares. So this is an augmentation of least squares to bring in side information, which means that if you adopt a Gaussian prior, and I'm not recommending this, this is for pedagogical purposes. If you adopt a Gaussian prior and you work through that, then you get a very simple expression in linear algebra terms for the solution. And that estimate is, is this, and it has two terms, one that's associated with least squares, which are these things, and one that's associated with the priors, which are these things. So for uniform white noise, then this becomes this, where you essentially have the variance of the data are weighting the prior against the fate that you put in the data itself. So as the variance of the data gets very small, the math estimate uh, trust the data, and you end up approaching the maximum likelihood or least squares estimate for your coefficients. On the other hand, as the variance gets very big, the 
the math estimate says, I don't trust my data, I trust my prior. And so the solution will approach the mean value for the coefficients themselves. So what you need to do with this approach is you need a way to uh, characterize the uh, covariance and mean of the, um, of the coefficients. So I'm going to walk you through um, how we might do this. Now this is a correlation map of 2,000 targets on module 2.1, which is one of our most thermally sensitive modules. And this is co and red is 1. So it turns out that the vast majority of these targets are all doing things that are highly correlated, <coughs> plus the correlation coefficient of 1. So it means that you can take 1,400 of these, as I did, and do an SVD and then say, how many components explain most of the variability? It's about 10. So um, the stars that are not dancing along with the other stars are those variable stars that are doing their own thing, where they're dominated by stellar variability, intrinsic stuff going on in the star, not by instrumental systematics. So by the end, um, so here's the first term in an SVD decomposition. You see all this here? That's caused by a heater cycling on and off of reaction wheel assembly 3-4. Uh, this component was getting more and more shade over time during this period of time. And when the heater kicked on, it would heat up about 5 degrees C and then turn off. And then when the temperature drifted back down, it would heat up again by 5 degrees C and turn off. And as it got more and more shade, it was turning on more and more often. In fact, at the end, it was just cycling on, cycling on off. Um, this 5 degree change in temperature on the box on the outside of the spacecraft, which is supposed to be thermally isolated from the telescope, is causing a, approximately a 1 micron change in the distance between the CCD detectors and the primary mirror. So we can see this easily by eye, not just, uh, and we can see it at the pixel level. So this is a very sensitive instrument. It allows us to know a lot about the instrument that we don't want to know about, right? Um, and the other features you see are, uh, we desaturate the reaction wells every three days, and that can TV's hubs. Because for whatever reason, that changes the shape of the telescope. With the, uh, when you do that, you change the temperature of various components. Um, and as the sun appears to rotate about the barrel of the telescope, uh, then the thermal situation changes, and we get uh, large changes in focus when the sun is pointed at the back end of the telescope, because it's in orbit about the sun, pointing at one field of view. So uh, during the summer, we're pointed away from the sun, and, and the sun you can see the bottom of the, of the the back end of the of the spacecraft, and on the other side, you know, we're over here. So uh, anyway, uh, so this is the first component. It looks like a lot of the systematics that we learned to uh, love as one of loves, um, I don't know, <laughs> certain cousins that get drunk at your wedding. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, but this is, if we plot uh, the net, the, this coefficient goes with this term when we fit all the light groups. These are 2,000, you know, 2,000 fits, one for each star. And this is what that coefficient looks like as a function of Kepler magnitude, and you can see their structure in here. So this gives us information that we can use to inform the prior. In this case, this coefficient is a function of the magnitude of the star, and the width of the distribution is a function of the magnitude as well. So we can use those to, in, in this little toy sort of demonstration that this can work, and establish Gaussian priors for each of these coefficients based on <coughs> these scatter plots. So now, why would you expect them to be Gaussian? You might look at this and say, that's not Gaussian at all, if you, if you look for you look at the kind of cluster, and they are. But this is just uh, sort of like, just to demonstrate that, that we got something going here. We are developing an, an empirical method to estimate the PDS. Um, and so this example, whatever, one of our uh, empirical PDS. But that's under development now. What I can show you today, there were the results of um, uh, doing this map that using these Gaussian priors. And so here's an R Lyrae star. These stars explode once every 12 hours or so. They're very interesting. They're related to the Cepheids, so they're, they establish the distance scale to other galaxies. And so they're standard panels, even though they explode every half day or so. Um, and the least square fit provides you with a fit that's the green curve, and it's got a lot of no you know, noise on it, apparent noise on it, that if you subtract the green curve from the blue curve, bad stuff happens, right? Uh, what you can see is that over time, this thing is getting dimmer. Now, that's not what the star is doing, but the focus is changing over time, and the, and the images are getting more spread out, more blurry. Uh, the map that recognizes that, and so the red curve, allows you to correct out for the focus, the broad, long-term focus shift, uh, without introducing a lot of extra noise. Uh, here's another example. This is one of the typical stars that's very quiet, that's the, on this module, it's dominated by systematics. And in this case, the least squares fit in the map that are comparable. Um, the map that trusts the data, but the data are close to where, uh, coefficients are close to where they should be anyway. Um, so, 
this appears to be a very good technique to deal both with quiet stars. For the most part, we're doing a good job at quiet stars, as well as for the more astrophysically interesting stars that stick out like sore thumbs uh, when you don't deal with them correctly. So and then this is that other target I showed you earlier where um, we were doing a poor job with uh, these squares that we were doing. Uh, but again, the map recognizes that this star is variable and trusts the priors over the data. So it does not reduce the, you know, it doesn't attempt to do this crazy fit to reduce the bulk R mass, which is what least squares is trying to do. Okay, so um, conclusions. Uh, Kepler mission is returning a wealth of exoplanet science, and I didn't have time to talk about today, but also astro seismology to study uh, um, oscillations and pulsations of stars. And we really are revolutionizing that field. In fact, there are many more publications coming out of Kepler for astro seismology than there are for planets. <laughs> Um, and that's because people have been waiting for decades uh, for something like this to get such contiguous long-term photometric time series on variable stars so they could actually study the pulsations of the stars. The great thing about astroseismology is that if you study the tones, because all the stars are ringing like bells, the sun rings typically um, at a, well, it's got a coma frequencies, but they're about five minute time scales. But you can study the, the intervals in, in between the tones and frequency space and those are related to uh, the size of the star and the mass of the star. So you learn something about the composition and structure of the star, and you can also get, in, for a brightest uh, star, you can get the radius to 1%. It's much, much better you can get from any other technique available today. Our stars are far away, uh, relatively speaking. They're very close in other ways, but uh, 1,000 to 3,000 light years. <coughs> Okay, so um, astroseismology is very exciting. In fact, this, uh, and then uh, Kiplar's, uh, these RLI rays are very exciting because there's, uh, if you see this modulation of the envelope, that's called the Blaschko effect. And uh, that's a mystery. Nobody knows what's causing the Blaschko effect. It's modulation and then intensity. And they come in all kinds of time scales. Most of them are on times of 10 days or longer. Nobody knows what's causing that. That's been known for 107 years or so. But nobody's known. And our astro seismologists believe that Kepler data will allow us to crack this mystery and solve it. So, so that's that's all very exciting. Um, what has worked out very well, although we are tuning it up, because data aren't perfect, uh, is the wavelet based approach that allows us to detect small planets in the presence of time bearing non white observation noise and stellar variability. And uh, this map approach looks very promising. Um, because we can use it to authentic current approach running up approach in PDC and bring some reason to the coefficients that we're getting uh, so that we can reconstruct uh, the physical constraints underlying uh, what's going on between the perturbations like pointing and focus change on actual measurements and develop an implicit model. And, uh, and it promises to improve our ability to identify remove instrumental signatures while, while preserving in terms of stellar variability that's of such great interest to, um, to exoplanet science as well as to astroseismologists. So that's why I came here today to talk to you about and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have at this point. <coughs> Yeah, 
uh, in the habitable zones of you know, stars with different spectral types. And uh, TPF, trans, uh, terrestrial climate finder, which is kind of a misnomer, is going to be, well, we don't know exactly what's going to be the pre-proposed architecture. So the idea is to be able to image and take spectra of the planets to look for biomarkers in the atmosphere to constrain that. Um, that's probably decades away now. Uh, so but right now, that's what people think it's going to take to do the job. So Kepler's job is to define the search states for these follow-on um, approaches so that we can actually scale them appropriately and cost them and get them going. And you've been waiting patiently. Well, um, that's one of the greatest surprises um, I've seen is so many multiple systems so early. Uh, if you look at the solar system from somewhere out there in the galaxy, we have a random position on the sky. If you see Earth transit, you have about a 12% chance of seeing the space. So you could say, well, maybe you'll see 10% of the time. What we see is that 20 per, about 20% of the target stars they have transiting can planet candidates have multiple transiting planet candidates. So the system <coughs> I talked about earlier, which I thought I had slided here to illustrate, uh, Kepler 11 has six transiting planets. So if you look at the whole system, it's about, remember those old LP, you know, old records, LPs, about this thing. So the system is about as flat as an LP. The inner five are within the orbit of Mercury. And they're about as, that system is about as flat as a compact disk. So these are very complainer systems. And, and what Kepler, one of the things that Kepler is doing very early on, which I didn't expect, so it's showing that multiple transmit systems are very, appear to be very common. That indicates that the coplanarity of these systems is very high, so they're very flat. And uh, this was something that was in deep question leading up to Kepler, because beforehand with radio velocity surveys, you're sensitive to more massive planets generally. A lot of the giant planets are in highly eccentric orbits, and they're and they're and ones in multiple where they detect multiple planets are, are often highly there's a lot of dispersion and inclinations. So if you so if that proved to be the rule for smaller systems, <coughs> then that would indicate that it seemed to imply that uh, our solar system is kind of weird because we, we don't have dispersion of a degree or so. So we have some you know wackos in terms of Pluto and Mercury and stuff, but um, but it appears that nature loves to make multiple planet systems and it likes to form them in planes. So this sort of uh, boosts our confidence that, that the general model for how planets form from the planetary nebula velocity into the disk is right. And a lot of these systems that we've seen with radial velocity um, that uh, high eccentricities and dispersions and inclinations are, are probably driven by stochastic events late in the life cycle of those systems. Okay. I don't know if this question makes any sense, but uh, are you able to find the properties of the hot star? Uh, we, we do. We, we, uh, I had a stellar classification program that Dave Latham carried out with his group that lasted for about four years prior to launch, where uh, they took uh, basically multi channel photometry in a, they used the Sloan filters and some others. Uh, uh, our whole field, in fact, more than our field, because we ended up moving our field after they got started. But they, they uh, have delivered us a catalog with effective temperature estimates and log Gs and all the information that they could um, find in other existing catalogs. Um, it has 4.5 million objects in it that fall on our silicon. And so we have going in estimates of how big these stars are and how bright they are and how, um, how hot they are. And then when we uh, detect a planet, we need to follow up because uh, you really want to do this using spectroscopy, not using multi-channel spectrometry. So although it proved to be very, very good, one of the biggest questions is how can you separate the giants from the dwarfs, the things that are burning helium from the things that are burning hydrogen still? Because we want the small hydrogen burners. And there's this question, can you do it with photometry? It turns out that 90% of the time, the Kepler Info Catalog got it right. So it did a really good job, much better than I expected, and many other people of discriminating between the giants and dwarf stars based on the photometry. <laughs> but one of the first things to do with follow up is did the kick get it right? Is it the right effective pressure? Is it the right size? Um, is it the right mass? 